damn, pulse annihilated. I was following with anxiety its beatings, endeavoring to ascertain whether the vital principle was extinct. When I saw Novarez enter the room, pale, his hair in disorder, and in the utmost agitation, the poor fellow, weakened by 48 hours, 48 days sufferings of an acute hepatitis accompanied by Seneca, was scarcely beginning to be convalescent, but having heard of the dangerous state in which the emperor was, he had caused himself to be brought down and entered the apartment, bathed in tears, to see once more a master whom he had served so many years. I endeavored to prevail upon him to withdraw, but his emotion increased as I spoke to him. He fancied that the emperor was threatened and was calling him to his assistance, and he would not leave him, but would fight and die for him. He was quite lightheaded. I flattered his zeal, succeeded in calming him, and returned to the patient. 11 a.m., Borborygny swelling and tension of the abdomen, icy coldness of the lower extremities, and in a short time of the whole body. I fixed lips closed and contracted violent agitation of the nostrils, most complete adenomia, pulse extremely weak and intermittent, varying from 102 to 108 and 110, and 112 pulsations per minute, breathing slow, intermittent, and stertorous, spasmodic, contraction of the epigastric region and of the stomach, deep sighs, piteous moans, convulsive movements, which ended by a loud and dismal shriek. I placed a blister on the chest and one on each thigh, applied two large synapsisms on the soles of the feet and fomentations on the abdomen with a bottle filled with hot water. I also endeavored to refresh the emperor's lips and mouth by constantly moistening them with a mixture of common water, orange, flower water, and sugar, but the passage was spasmodically closed. Nothing was swallowed, all was in vain. The intermittent breathing and mournful sound still continued, accompanied by a violent agitation of the abdominal muscles. The eyelids remained fixed, the eyes moved and fell back under the upper lids the pulse sunk and rallied again it was 11 minutes before six o'clock napoleon was about to breathe his last a slight froth covered his lips he was no more such is the end of all human glory all immediately dispersed and nothing was heard but tears and lamentations the cruel loss we had sustained had plunged everyone in the deepest affliction before we could recover from the kind of stupor produced by the first shock of our grief two englishmen taking advantage of the opportunity slipped in amongst us entered the drawing room uncovered and touched the body of the emperor and withdrew as they had come this act of profanation restored us to our senses we returned into the room with a corpse leg in order to watch over it it was not to be polluted by english hands after the emperor had been dead six hours i caused him to be shaved and had the body washed and placed on another bed the ec Executors on their side had taken cognizance of two codicils, which were to be opened immediately after the emperor's decease. One of these codicils was relative to the gratifications which he granted upon his privy purse to all the persons composing his household and to the alms which he ordered to be distributed to the poor of St. Helena. The other contained instructions as to his funeral and was thus worded. 16th April, 1821, Longwood. This is a codicil to my will. It is my wish that my ashes may repose on the banks of the Seine in the midst of the French people whom I love so well. Two, leave to Count Bertrand and Watson and to Marchand the money, jewels, plate, china, furniture, books, arms, and generally everything belonging to me in the island of St. Helena. This codicil, entirely written with my own hand, is signed by me and sealed with my arms. Napoleon. The executors communicated the contents of this document to the governor, who exclaimed against the pretensions expressed in it, declaring that a compliance with it was inadmissible and that he entirely opposed it. The body was to remain on the island. England was anxious to keep it and would not let it go. We endeavored to appeal from this decree dictated by hatred representations entreaties were all tried without effect the body of napoleon was to remain in saint helena and there it should remain the executors invoked humanity and the respect due to the dead but right 
vanishes before might. And all that could be done was to adopt the resource of the weak to protest and obey. Discourse was pursued at a spot which the emperor, although he had only seen it once, continually spoke of it with satisfaction, was chosen to receive his remains. It was near the spring whose waters had so often allayed his cruel sufferings. Hudson assented to this choice. He had held since the year 1820 the order to retain the body of Bonaparte. But it was indifferent to him in what part of the island it was buried. This point settled, he immediately mounted his horse and proceeded to Longwood. At the head of his staff, the member of his council, General Coffin, Rear Admiral Lambert, and the Marquis de Montchenu, and all the physicians and surgeons of the island. He wished to be assured by his own inspection that the emperor was really dead that the corpse before him was really that of Napoleon. He also wished that the body might be immediately open. But I observed to him that it was too soon after death, and he did not insist. You have asked me for some plaster to mold the face of the deceased, said he. One of my surgeons is very skillful in that kind of operation. He will assist you. I thanked his excellency, but the operation was so easy that I wanted no assistance. What I really wanted was plaster, for Madame Bertrand, notwithstanding her repeated requests, had only yet received a kind of lime, and I was at a loss what to do. But Dr. Burton pointed out a spot on the coast where gypsum was to be found. The Admiral immediately gave orders for a boat to put out to sea, and in a few hours afterwards some fragments were brought and calcined. Having obtained some plaster, I molded the face and proceeded to the autopsy of the corpse. The executors, generals Bertrand and Monchelin and Marchand, were present at this affecting operation, which was also witnessed by Sir Thomas Reed, a few staff officers, and Drs. Thomas Short, or not, Charles Mitchell, Matthew Livingston, surgeon in the service of the East India Company, and some other medical men, together eight in number, whom I had invited. Napoleon had destined his hair to be distributed amongst the different members of his family, and whilst his head was being shaved, I verified some observations I had already made, and the principle of which were as follows. Number one, the emperor had grown considerably thinner since my arrival at St. Helena. His bulk was not a fourth part of what it had been. Second, the face and body were pale, but free from alteration or a cadaverous aspect, the expression of the features was fine. The eyes were closed, and it might have been thought not that the emperor was dead, but that he was reposing in a profound sleep. His mouth preserved a smiling expression, with the exception of a slight contraction of the left side caused by the convulsive smile observed in his last moments. Third, the body exhibited the wound occasioned by an issue on the left arm. At several scars, V's, one on the head, there on three on the left leg, one of which was on the malleolus externus, one at the extremity of the digitus annularis of the left hand, and several on the left thigh. Fourth, the entire height of the body from the top of the head to the heels was five feet two different measurements, and four lines. Fifth, the extent from the extremity of the middle finger of one hand to that of the other was five foot two inches. Sixth, from the symphysis of the os pubis to the top of the head, the length was two feet seven inches and four lines. Seventh, from the os pubis to the calcineum, the length was two feet seven inches. Eighth, the length from the top of the head to the chin was seven inches and six lines. Ninth, the circumference of the head was 20 inches and 10 lines. The forehead was high, the temple slightly depressed, the sinciput wide and very strongly defined tenth. Hair thin and of a light chestnut color, 11. Neck rather short, but tolerably well proportioned, 12. Chest wide and well formed, 13th. Abdomen considerably swelled and voluminous, 14th. Hands and feet rather small, 15th. Limbs stiff and extended, 16. All the other parts of the body were nearly in the ordinary proportions. I felt a curiosity to examine the head of this great man. According to the craniological system of Drs. Gall and Spurzheim, the following 
are the signs which were most apparent on it. Number one, organ of dissimulation. Two, organ of conquest. Whatever. The organ of individuality or knowledge of individuals and things, the organ of locality. I can't make it. The courts had now been lying more than 20 hours, and I therefore proceeded to the autopsy. I first opened the chest, and the most remarkable appearance it exhibited were following. The cartilages of the res were, for the most part, ossified. The sac formed by the costal pleura of the left side contained about a glass of fluid of a citrine color. A slight coat of coagulable lymph covered the part of the surfaces of the costal and pulmonary pleurae corresponding to the same side. The left lung was slightly compressed by the effusion and adhered by numerous bridles to the posterior and lateral parts of the chest and to the pericardium. I carefully dissected it and found the superior lobe covered with tuberculae and some small tuberculous excavations. A slight coat of coagulable lymph covered part of the surface of the costal and pulmonary pleurae corresponding to that side. The sac of the costal pleura on the right side contained about two glasses of fluid of a citrine color. The right lung was slightly compressed by effusion but its parenchyma was in a healthy state. Both lungs were generally speaking firm and of their natural color, the mucous membrane of the trachea, artia, and of the bronchiae was tolerably red and lined with a rather considerable quantity of pituitous matter thick and viscous. Many of the ganglions of the bronchiae and of the mediastinum were rather enlarged, almost degenerated, and in a state of superation, the pericardium was in a healthy state and contained about an ounce of fluid of a citrine color. The heart, which was rather larger than the fist of the subject, exhibited, though sound, a rather abundant proportion of fat at its base and on its ridges. The aorta and pulmonary ventricles and the corresponding auricles were were in a state of proper conformation, but pale and contain no blood. The orifices did not exhibit the appearance of any material injury. The large arterial and venous vessels about the heart were likewise empty, although generally in a state of proper conformation, the abdomen exhibited the following appearance. Distension of the peritoneum produced by a great quantity of gas, a soft, transparent, and diffluent exudation lining the whole extent of the internal surface of the peritoneum. The epiplume was in a state of proper conformation. The spleen and the liver, which was hardened, were very large and distended with blood. The texture of the liver, which was of a brownish red color, did not, however, exhibit any remarkable alteration of structure. The vesica phallus was filled and distended with very thick and clotted bile. The liver, which was affected by chronic hepatitis, closely adhered by its convex surface to the diaphragm. The adhesion occupied the whole extent of that organ and was strong cellular and of long existence. The concave surface of the left lobe adhered closely and strongly to the corresponding part of the stomach, particularly along the small curve of that organ and to the epiplume. At every point of contact, the lobe was sensibly thickened, swelled, and hardened. The stomach appeared at first sight in a perfectly healthy state, no trace of irritation or phlegosis, and the peritoneal membrane ex exhibited the most satisfactory appearance. But on examining that organ with care, I discovered on its interior surface near the small curve and at the breadth of three fingers from the pylorus, a slight obstruction apparently of a serious nature of little extent and exactly circumscribed. The stomach was perforated through and through in the center of that small induration, the aperture of which was closed by the adhesion of that part to the left lobe of the liver. The volume of the stomach was smaller than is usually found 
On opening that organ along its large curve, I observed that part of its capacity was filled with a considerable quantity of matters, slightly consistent and mixed with a great quantity of glarous substances, very thick and of a color resembling the sediment of coffee, and which exhaled an acrid and infectious color. These substances being removed, the mucous membrane of the stomach was ascertained to be sound from the small to the large cavity of this organ following the great curve. Almost the whole of the remainder of the internal surface of the stomach was occupied by a cancerous ulcer whose center was in the upper part along the small curve of the stomach, whilst the irregular digital and linguiform borders of its circumference extended both before and behind that internal surface and from the orifice of the cardia to within a good inch of the pilaris. Its rounded opening obliquely cut in the shape of a basil at the expense of the internal surface of the organ scarcely occupied a di diameter of four or five lines inside and at most two lines and a half outside the circular border of that opening was extremely thin slightly denticulated blackish and only formed by the peritoneal membrane of the stomach an ulcerous grayish and smooth surface line this kind of canal which but for the adhesion of the liver would have established a communication between the cavity of the stomach and that of the abdomen. The right extremity of the stomach at the distance of an inch from the pylorus was surrounded by a tumor or rather a surus annular in duration. A few lies in with the orifice of the pylorus was in a perfect state. The lips of the ulcer exhibited remarkable fungus swellings, the base of which were hard and thick and in a serous state and extended also over the whole surface occupied by that cruel disease. The little epiplume was contracted, swollen, very much hardened and degenerated. The lymphatic glands of that peritoneal membrane, those placed along the curves of the stomach, as well as those near the pillars of the diaphragm, were in part tumefied and serous, some even in a state of superation. The digestive canal was distended by the presence of a great quantity of gas. I observed in the peritoneal surface and in the peritoneal doubling small specks and patches of a pale red color of various dimensions and scattered at some distance from each other the mucous membrane of this canal appeared to be in a sound state the large intestines were covered with a substance of blackish color and extremely viscous the right kidney was sound that on the left side was out of its place being thrown back upon the lumbar vertebrae it was longer and narrower than the other in other respects it appeared sound the bladder which was empty and much contracted contained a certain quantity of gravel mixed with some small calculi numerous red spots were scattered upon its mucous membrane and the coats of the organ were in a diseased state i wished to examine the brain, the state of that organ in such a man as the emperor was the object of the highest interest, but my proceedings were unfeelingly arrested, and I was obliged to yield. Having finished this melancholy operation, I detached the heart and stomach and put them in a silver vase filled with spirits of wine. I afterwards connected the separate parts by a suture, washed the body, and made room for the valet de chambre, who dressed it as the emperor was usually dressed during his life. Jars, white cursimer breeches, white waistcoat, white cravat, and over that black one fastened behind with a buckle the ribbon of the grand cross of the legion of honor the uniform of colonel of the chasseurs de la garde decorated with the orders of the legion of honor and of the iron crown long boots a la ecuyer with small spurs and lastly a cocked hat thus dressed napoleon was at a quarter before six removed from the drawing room into which the crowd immediately entered the sheet and linen that had been used in the dissection of the body were carried away torn in pieces and distributed they were stained with his blood and everyone wished therefore to have a fragment of them